So what I want to do is I want to share with you a little bit of neuroscience before lunch. How many people's brains right now are just full? Yeah, so here's an inch. the rest of you are liars. But anyway, because <laughs> I know. What do you, here's a question. What do you think is the longest period of time the human brain can do what you're doing right now, which is sitting in a chair in a dark, dim room, breathing other people's oxygen. It's fully depleted, right? And, and, and using the, the cognitive part of your brain to filter what I'm saying and turn it into something. Like just using that part of the brain that listens to words. How, what do you think is the longest period of time you can actually learn anything? 15, 20 minutes. Okay, I need danger pay for sure. The longest period of time your brain can stay focused and learn anything is 90 minutes. Nine zero. And that's got to be highly entertaining stuff. So thank you for the 15 minutes, all of you. Appreciate that. <laughs> I'm going to have to, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to get paid. Yeah. So the reason I share that, how many people have been at a presentation with a prospect that lasts more than 90 minutes? Anyone ever demoed for more than 90 minutes? Yeah, just so you know, at that 90 minute point, it's empty. There's nothing else going in there. So I want to I wanna leave us uh, with something to, uh, to think about. <laughs> Uh, that's going to that's going to that's going to bring us into the afternoon. If you if you look at the image of this woman's face, right? Because what I'm doing now, I am now moving you out of your analytical brain, and I'm moving you into uh, your 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 emotional brain, right? Your limbic system. So when you see this woman's face, what emotion do you feel she is experiencing? Some sadness, a bit of anguish. Yeah. How about joy? Anyone? Usually one sociopath in the group. <laughs> no? OK, it's going to be a good afternoon. Right, so it doesn't really matter where I use this image in the world. We get the same responses. Right? Some form of sadness, despair, and anguish. What's the answer to that? <laughs> get grown. Not the answer, but I hear it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Now, when I was talking to Brent about this workshop, one of the prerequisites was that we would work with a team that at least had a grade 12 level of mathematical education. <laughs> Nobody laughs. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this, this question here. Is this a simple or a complicated question? It's very complicated. How many, did you, how many of you sat there and said, well, you know, Mark, interesting question. Well, the head's tilted at a 45 degree angle. Her uh, hand is on her forehead. The eyes are cast down, and there's a small frown. Therefore, based on all of the information, I think this woman is experiencing some sadness. Anyone? No. How long did it take you to make a decision about what the emotion was? One second. Nanoseconds. So fast. Right? Now, this thing here, I can leave this up on screen for three minutes. Before somebody cracks and breaks the calculator out or... Yes! Yeah. See? How many answers are there to this? There's one. It's binary. So how can we look at this and figure it out in a heartbeat? And how can we look at this and kind of really kind of... It's because of the different parts of the brain that are used to do the actual calculations. So I talked earlier about 40 instructions per second versus 9 million instructions per second. So the part of your brain that was looking at this woman's face, 9 million instructions per second. <clears throat> this one here, 40 instructions per second. This is very important. Because right? what we're going to do in, in the afternoon is we're going to transition into a conversation about customer acquisition. The morning was really anchored in the business model, sort of. What do I want to be? Differentiation. And then how do I want to bring a solution to market? As we transition into this content, it's going to be really focused on, well, how do we engage people emotionally? So here's a picture of your brain. Not really your brain, somebody's brain, under an fMRI machine. Right? So the way an fMRI machine works, how many people have had an MRI? Yeah, an MRI. But yeah. So the fMRI, it's a circular uh, a cylinder. It goes around your head, and it monitors blood flow in your brain. 
So the reason I know what part of your brain was active when we looked at those two exercises is because of machines like this. We know exactly what part of the brain makes decisions. Right? And it is not the part that was looking at the mathematical equation. Right? So when you make a choice, uh, there's always a neural firing in your emotional or limbic system. And then uh, 500 milliseconds later, uh, there's a firing uh, in uh, the cognitive part of your brain. The emotional part of your brain has no capacity for language. So it can't put words to the decision. That's the, that's the responsibility of the cognitive brain. So you make a decision emotionally, and then someone will say, well, why did you choose that? And then you make up a bunch of stuff. <laughs> oh, it's true. Yeah, can't make this stuff up. So here's a funny thing. Uh, there's a number of different uh, company types in the world that buy these machines. Uh, obviously, uh, research universities, neuroscientists. Uh, but one of the biggest buyers is uh, consumer packaged goods companies. How much do you think it costs the Lever Brothers or Johnson & Johnson to launch a new toothpaste? Think about that. Right? They just they got to design it. Millions. $50 million. What do you think the failure rate is within three months of new product launches? 85%. So they buy these things by the truckload. They cost seven million bucks a piece. And what they do is they get subjects like us to uh, look at commercials, uh, look at images, uh, smell the product. And what they've learned to do is ignore everything that comes out of people's mouths. Now, there's so much science behind this. Right? So, so the decision making happens at an unconscious level. I could talk for hours about it, but you'd be bored. Right? Uh, that's a, a physical representation of the processing power of your emotional brain. And that there, although the dot is a bit big, is there a physical representation of the processing power of the analytical part of your brain, which you think you think with? Think about that. <laughs> There's your buyer. <laughs> right there. I mean, hey, Canada. Anyone here sell the oil and gas? <laughs> yeah, there's your IT guy. <laughs> I tell you, the only reason I got good at selling is because IT people hated me. They did. I would be in an IT meeting selling some IT thing with computer associates, and they realized pretty quickly this idiot doesn't know anything. I'm not a member of the tribe. So I got forced to learn how the business actually bought because I could never sell to the CIO. Big learning. There's your IT guy in my world. So the reason I share this is because a lot of the decisions that occur in the buying journey are largely unconscious. Um, and as long as you're comfortable with the concept of evolution, however long you feel we've been on the planet, um, the decision making is primarily designed around survival. Again, it's a, in Canada what we call a nine beer conversation. But I just want to anchor it. <laughs> hey, now I know who my tribal members are. Right? So why is this so important? Well, if you accept or you're comfortable with the concept that the decision-making process happens largely at a non-conscious level, not an unconscious level, but at a non-conscious level, right? think about the messages that you create in your company, the marketing materials, the sales pitch decks, the descriptions, the value propositions that you create. If they're anchored in things like capabilities, our people, our location, our experience, our years in business, the price, you are speaking directly to the part of the brain that's responsible for the smallest part of the decision making. However, if your organization focuses just a little bit more energy and effort on emotions consciously, I'm going to teach you how to do this this afternoon. You can go and implement most of this stuff tomorrow. Actually, you'll be here. And then the Microsoft will be sad. So don't do it tomorrow. But you can do it the next day. Right? But if you just consciously focus on engaging emotions, if you consciously focused on creating a bias, right? if you consciously focused on the engagement experience itself, you'd be shocked at the results because that's where the majority of the decision making makes. So you still have to have a good product at a good price that's competitive, and you've got to have good people. Those are table stakes. But just a little bit of energy and effort down here can have a monumental impact on your results. But you've got to know your customer to do it. It's impossible to be emotionally engaging 
at a horizontal level. Impossible. Can't be done. I don't know how to do it. Right? So I want to share one last piece with you, and then we'll break for lunch. Uh, those of you that walked in the room this morning got one look at me and went, oh, geez, I wonder if there's an early flight. Right? That, <laughs> that's what we call a heuristic. It's a shortcut. Right? A stereotype is a heuristic. It's a brain's way of preserving energy. Right? So it takes shortcuts all day long to preserve energy. Right? So this is a heuristic. How many people have seen this before somewhere? Right, yeah, right, it's kind of it's been around a long time. A study that was done by the Cambridge uh, University, and what they've learned is that uh, as long as the first and last letter in a sentence are accurate, you can read it just as quickly as if it was spelled appropriately. Why? Well, because you don't read letters, you remember pictures of words. So again, you got, you got two parts of your brain. Who here is actually as teenagers that are learning to drive? Oh, I'm so sorry. I've got two, right? So they're in the car, and they're using their cognitive brain. So, OK, hands on the wheel, right? I've got that foot going, and I've got, to, got to get my music right, a few little texting, right, you know? They've got all this stuff going on. I've got to turn. I've got to do this. They're whole 40 instructions per second, and they're trying to drive a car. Now, how many of you leave your office and get home and don't know how you got there? Yeah, we've all done it. Because what you do over time is you take the hard stuff that you need to think about and you move it to the four, the nine million instructions per second. Right? It's a perfect example of the heuristic. Your brain takes a shortcut. Now this is the part you're not going to like and then we're going to break for lunch. This is actually how people buy. Who here feels like you make rational, logical decisions? <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a loaded question. No one's putting their arm in the air now. I know how this Canadian works with his rhetorical questions. This is actually how your brain makes decisions. The first thing, these are all heuristics. You pay a close attention to the beginning. It's called primacy. Your brain is wired to pay attention to the beginning because it wants to make a quick decision. Is this worth putting my energy into? And if it's not, you're all senior executives. You don't even flinch. You can still look like you're very focused, but you're not. You're doing a laundry list of stuff back in the head, right? But, but so we are hardwired to pay very close attention to beginnings. The next thing that happens after that is your brain needs to anchor on something. It does not like loose bits of data, right? So it'll, it'll anchor on something and compare and contrast, right? So everything that comes after it wants to compare and contrast. That's how it makes decisions. It doesn't like, hey, the price is 80 bucks. I need something to compare it to. Right? After that, it goes into the premature cognitive commitment, which is I make up my mind really quickly based on no data. Now, the next one is actually pretty dangerous. Once you've made up your mind, it's actually inefficient to change it. So you go into confirmation bias, which is allowing in all of the information that suggests your decision was brilliant but ignoring all of the information that suggests you might have made a mistake. Has anyone ever done that? Yeah, that's actually your brain being efficient. It's actually not very accurate, but there you go. Right? And then the worst of them all, the consistency principle, you are hardwired, hardwired as a human being to remain consistent. And it's anchored in social sciences. Right? So if you accept that we spent a fair bit of time in small tribes, uh, everybody in a small tribe had a role to play. Everybody contributes. So inconsistent behavior, unpredictable behavior, was actually a liability to the tribe. Now, we don't live in small tribes anymore, but your brain hasn't moved out of that cycle. And then the last part of these is recency. So your brain is hardwired to pay attention to the beginning, and it's hardwired to pay attention to the end. So you will remember the beginning and the ending of jobs. You remember the beginning and the ending of classes. You remember the beginning and the ending of a holiday. You'll begin, remember the beginning and the ending of relationships. You will forget the middle because your brain is wired to. There's no space for it. So here's the decision-making process that all of your customers go through. Pay close attention to the at the beginning of everything. Anchor on some piece of information that I think is valuable. Form an opinion very, very quickly. Ignore everything that suggests I made a mistake. Never change my mind. Right? And then at the end, 
kind of go in again just to make sure that I haven't made a mistake. Now, would you call that rational or irrational? Highly irrational. So this model was developed by uh, one of the, the, the thought leaders of behavioral economics, Dan Ariely, uh, wrote a book called Predictably Irrational. So his argument is that human beings are highly irrational in their decision making, but very predictable. Right? So if you apply this here to a sales cycle, you'll find most of your sales organization today does the opposite. I'm going to leave that with us. Right? We're going to break for lunch now. Right? But I'm going to argue that most of what your marketing, we'll call it the customer acquisition motion today, most of it violates how we unconsciously want to buy. Now, the reason we've been able to get away with it for years was because the vendors had all of the information. There was no way for customers to get what we had. But today, the customers have access to everything that we have. And so as a result, they don't need us for anything anymore. But we haven't changed our customer acquisition model yet.